Hey guys, today I want to talk about cohabitation or communal housing. The idea of keeping more than one animal in a single enclosure. Hi, I'm TC Houston, former zookeeper and lifelong reptile enthusiast. And you're watching Reptile Mountain TV, a place where I can share my passion of keeping and breeding blue tongue skinks and a few others just for fun. Okay, cohabitation and community housing is often a hot, controversial topic, and it really doesn't need to be. So today I want to do some discussing of the concepts, okay? And the reason that certain people are so adamantly against it or so adamantly for it, I want to go into some of that because open discussion is what breeds more knowledge, okay? I don't want to just close down the discussion and say, well, this is the way. Um, I want to put it out there. I do expect, I expect from you, the viewer, that you are going to take this information and process it, analyze it, and see how it applies to you. I also expect that you're going to be open-minded, willing to hear, and use rational thought to go forward with this information, okay? Um, so I want to start off with the, the levels of risk in captive um, care. Now we're talking about all animals in captivity, we're talking specific, I'm, you know, usually I'm talking about skinks, but I'm talking about the idea of keeping these, these animals in captivity as a whole. That includes um, the person who just bought their first skink at a reptile show or went to a pet shop and bought their first skink and then it's their first uh, lizard, and the person who is a professional herpticulturist, someone who does this for a living. So there's a whole gamut here. Those, both of those, um, people uh, can be addressed in this in this video. So, by first things first, keeping an animal, um, we want to look at whether or not should we house it communally, can we house it communally, or and cohabitation. Well, you look at evidence first. You look at evidence based on their biology and their natural history. Is the animal solitary in nature, or is it? Um, uh, social in nature and by social I don't mean like it gets on Facebook and and likes things but what I mean is by social I do mean that in nature they they group um, part of their behavior is in grouping behaviors where the thriving um, health of the animal is dependent upon the activity and interaction with other animals usually of the same species of the conspecific so we're talking like um, schools of fish or um, a troop of baboons or a herd of elephants those kinds of animals group animals social animals where social interactivity is something that's important so you want to look at that skinks most of the time at least blue tongues in the Taliqua genus, especially Taliqua skinkoides, are not social by nature. So solitary housing is acceptable. That means keeping them in a one animal per one enclosure, regardless of size. We're gonna size. I've done another video on size, so we're just talking about one one animal per unit. Okay, and um, that is the lowest level of risk. That is the lowest level of risk when it comes to housing an animal. Um, in captivity as far as um, interaction and risk of injury from another animal. If there's no other animal in there, there's real, really low risk. And that's the best choice. That is the best choice for someone who is new to the reptile husbandry um, idea. If you've never kept a skink before, or honestly, if you've kept less than two skinks for less than two years, you, that's the best choice for you is to keep them individually, okay? Um, and, and it doesn't mean you're you're not smart. It doesn't mean anything like that. It means that you just need some more time of hands-on understanding the behavior. You can read on the internet. You can get a Google degree, but you cannot replace hands-on experience with these animals. It can't be replaced and it can't be rushed. Okay, and why rush it? Enjoy your time learning about your animal. They're beautiful creatures. Enjoy that time. Okay, so bottom baseline. Um, easiest, lowest common denominator, however what you want to say, the lowest level of risk is one for one, okay? Then the next level of risk is a heterosexual pair, 1.1, a male and female in one enclosure. And this is okay if, there's a few factors you have to look into, is the male going to be constantly pest, uh, 
biologically uh, triggered to try and breed. So all he wants to do is breed. You know, there's this, this saying out there that men think about sex like every 10 seconds, right? So is your skink going to be so triggered to breed that he can't function any other way? He's just biologically wired. I must breed, I must breed, I must breed, I must breed. That's going to cause ongoing stress if the animal cannot get away from that including the female, where if she's going, I got a headache, I got a headache, I got a headache, and he's like, I want to breed, hey baby, hey baby, and she's like, I got a headache, you're going to have this issue. <laughs> you're going to have, now that's anthropomorphism, but but the reality is, um, these two animals, if the male is constantly pestering the female, both animals are going to be stressed to a, a, an extent, so you might not look at that, you might say, hmm, maybe that's too much of a risk. So there are some aspects where it could be a risk. Also, the size of the enclosure does matter when you're housing more than one. Because when you house more than one, a pair, you need to ensure that they can function fully independent if necessary. That means they can both hide alone in a cool area. They can both hide alone in a warm area. They can both eat in alone. And they can both drink alone. Because even humans who are married, not everybody wants to sit down at the table and have dinner together every single night of their life. Sometimes they're like, hey, I need some me time. I got to go eat dinner in my room. I'm going to have a hot pocket, okay? So even us have that issue. These animals, they may not have the emotional, personal need, but they may need space because we don't have the understanding of exactly what's going on. Seasonal changes can cause changes in the animal's behavior. Um, the health of an animal. If one animal is not doing as well, they may be more uh, prone to be defensive, and a defensive bite could damage your animal. The other animal, if he's just you know tootling along, and then the other animal thinks, ah, oh, I'm getting attacked, and they bite him, it could be serious. So, um, community housing is a risk, and when you go up in more than one animal, if you have two, you're risking one of those animals harming the other. Um, now, when you take on risk. It is your responsibility to then assume that you will um, address the consequences. That means if you put them together knowing that there is risk and you assume that risk and then the animal gets injured, it is a responsible thing to do to help and heal the animal, not just continually let the animal get harmed, okay? Um, then we're going to move up from pairs. So you want to look at making sure that each animal can do something independently and communally. Okay, so the size matters. A 40 gallon breeder is absolutely too small, period, end of story, no discussion. That is too small for two uh, blue tongue skink adults, period. It's too small because those animals can't thermoregulate and move around and do what they need to do independently you're going to need probably, I would say, three times that size, if that, but this is not a how-to video. This is something for you to consider. Um, so we go from two, then we go to a trio or a family group, a small family group, um, a menage a trois, the one male and two females, okay? So you want to do one male, two females. You don't want to do multiple males in a too small of an enclosure. It needs to be ridiculously large for multiple males because males will fight. It's just a fact of what they do. They are slightly territorial. And if you don't give each one enough territory, there's going to be just a constant fight and you are actually forcing the fight to happen, okay? Now, you also want to look at the biology, behavior, and individuality of each animal, okay? You could have a couple males that are just the most cool surfer dude type animals you've ever met in your life and they chill and they're cool then that might work for you but it's not across the board and so you have to use um, good assessment skills and you have to use your experience and so gaining experience is at most at it is utmost important so you have the small group family group then you have a large family group with multiples and then you have what's called a social group which means more than one male now, this is not all about skinks. This can be um, in multiple groups. Uh, like uh, when I worked at the zoo, we had social groups of animals where there was more than one male. Then we had family groups where we had like the gorillas and we had that kind of um, an aspect. And even in social groups and family groups, there were violent conflicts from animals that were social. Okay, and I remember one of the chimpanzees ones having to go into some serious surgery after the male darn near killed her, and they were family members, okay, and that was, we were supposed to keep them together, and we did, and she had enough space, and she still got 
injured. So there is those level of risks. And so if you're willing to accept those risks individually, that's cool. But you really need to have the experience first before you step into that. Those zoologists all had degrees at, at the zoo. We all had degrees. We all had extensive experience and we had people who were over us who have been more experience okay and we had to be, remain open-minded and scientific and evidence-based not emotions not feelings science okay um, evidence and that sort of thing so then we move to um, interspecies um, housing so that's like keeping when we were at the zoo, when our, there's a zoo I know that uh, has a Bothrychus schlegeli, the eyelash viper, and a green and black poison arrow frog, or poison dart frog, Dendrobates erratus, in the same enclosure. But schlegeli is arboreal, erratus is semi-arboreal, but it's mostly terrestrial. Um, and so you've got two different animals occupying two different environments in a same large enclosure. They are assuming risk, though. Um, if for some reason that schlegeli feels like they want to eat that frog, they're going to eat that frog. But a schlegeli, most of the time, they're not going to prey on frogs, uh, but more um, uh, rodents and birds. And so there is some risk there. Even when I was um, keeping, I was the lab manager for the displays, uh, the venomous display at my university. And we had two adult sidewinders that had never, no history ever of aggression towards each other and no history ever in recorded science of cannibalism in this species. In fact, I got to publish and do the first peer review when the female ate the male and then died. So we lost both animals. Um, and yay, I got a publication out of it. But what's sad is both animals co it cost them their lives uh, in order to find that out. Um, so even within the same species, so when you're doing interspecies, multiple species, you need to look and ensure that both animals are getting what they need and that they have the space to, and you have to look at the behavior and the, 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 the mindset. If you are keeping an animal that is a predator type and a prey type together, you are causing that prey type to constantly, sub, constantly be subjected to um, perceived predation. Okay, and that's something that you don't want to do. So um, I recommend against it at least. Um, I can't tell you what to do because you're your own person and that's awesome and I'm glad you're watching. Um, I want you guys to process this stuff, think about it. Open discussion is what breeds more progress, okay? So um, communal housing is something that is for more advanced keepers. Um, cohabitation is for more advanced keepers. Um, and size of the enclosure absolutely is essential um, for when you are housing multiple animals in the same enclosure. Also looking at their behavior, also looking at their natural history and individual personality traits or individual behavioral idios idiosyncrasies. These all matter. So anyway, I wanted to put that out there so that the discussion can be kept, uh, can thought uh, um, you could mull it around and we can talk about it more. It is absolutely essential that experience be built prior to trying something new. Please, if you are new to Blue Tongue Skinks, welcome to the community. Congratulations on picking one of the best pet reptiles you can possibly have. Gain some experience, work with your animals, keep an open mind, and learn their behavior, give it a couple years, get a couple, keep them individually, let them grow and learn from people, have a mentor, and move forward as you desire. But by all means, don't just pick up your first blue tongue skink and your first bearded dragon and try to hold them and house them in the same enclosure together asking how do I on Facebook because you're probably going to get chewed up by a lot of people who have a lot of passionate experience and opinion. So start slow. There's no rush. These aren't going anywhere anytime soon. And please, please hit that thumbs up button, will you? I love to see those thumbs up buttons. I love to hear comments. And um, please share these videos if you think they're worthwhile. If you want to discuss more, write down in the comments. We'll talk more about it. I really appreciate you and thanks for watching Reptile Mountain TV. I almost forgot. The reason when I'm talking about risk, what is the risk? It's the risk to the animal's health. Basically, skinks have a heck of a bite. And an adult blue tongue skink has the strength and power and ability to remove a tail and 
potentially remove a limb and for certain can break bones and cause significant damage to another skink. Therefore, if a fight goes bad, it's more than just a few scrapes and some hurt feelings, even though they don't really have feelings. It, is, it could be a serious trip to the vet and it could end up in some significant damage to the animal. Um, and I don't want that for your animal. I don't think you want that for your animal. So when I talk about what is that risk, the risk is the risk of significant and serious injury.